Welcome to Mind, Muscle, and Metabolism, the Jade Tita Podcast. Here you get the in-depth science and practical tools needed to change your body, optimize your health, and elevate your mindset. I'm Dr. Jade Tita, and here is what I want you to know. You are different. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. And those differences matter. They matter because there is only one rule to achieving optimal health, fitness, and body change. That rule, do what works for you. My goal is to help you understand exactly how. I'm so excited you're here. Your transformation starts right now. Okay, guys, welcome to the podcast today. This is episode number three, and today we're going to be talking about the five laws of metabolism. You know, it's funny, when we think about simplistic models, right, I say this often, when we think about simplistic models, we like those. As humans, we like simple uh, because we think that that allows us to, you know, figure the issues out, right? Like, as an example... Uh, eat less, exercise more. It sounds so logical, so simple. And we feel like, hey, if we could have a linear, predictable equation, wouldn't that be wonderful? And uh, the problem with that is, is that there's nothing linear, predictable, or fair about the way the metabolism functions. Remember, the metabolism is like a big stress barometer. It could care less about your vanity concerns. It could care less about your timetables. It could care less about whether or not uh, what you need to do is convenient for you or not. So eat less, exercise more is this simple model that leaves way too much um, to be figured out. It has no nuance. It's very black and white. So we like that to some degree, but then it falls apart in actual practice. Now, frameworks are different, right? They're not perfect, of course, but they're better than simple black and white ideas and these simplistic phrases like eat less and exercise more. A framework allows more nuance. It allows more gray. It allows us to... uh, conceptualize things a little bit better and it also allows us to take new information and attach that information to something that we have an understanding about and that's where I like to come up with frameworks and one of the frameworks that I've come up with is the five laws framework which essentially is just to say there's these are not real laws but they are my laws and they come from my clinical experience and my understanding and reading of the research and so inside these five laws are embedded an awful lot of information about the metabolism so I'm going to cover these uh, in detail and the truth of the matter I should say this it's very difficult to cover these in detail in a 20 or 30 minute podcast show and so I'm going to give you an overview and probably cover each of these separately in future episodes So let's get into them real quick. Here are the five laws of metabolism. Law number one is the law of metabolic compensation, which essentially says that the metabolism is not a calculator, nor is it a chemistry set. It's more like a seesaw or a boomerang or a pendulum. It's most like a thermostat. In other words, it is adaptive and reactive to everything you do. So the law of metabolic compensation says you do one thing to the metabolism, the metabolism will push back against you in the other direction. That is important to understand. The second law is a law that I call the law of metabolic multitasking. What we need to understand is that the metabolism likes to either be building up tissue, anabolism, building fat and building muscle at the same time, or it likes to be burning, catabolism, burning fat and burning muscle at the same time. And this is important because you'll see this a lot in uh, the world of weightlifting or gyms. You'll see lots of weightlifters being bulky fat. They are really big and bulky, but they aren't very lean. And then you'll also see lots of people who do aerobic exercise. You'll see them, you know, sort of being skinny fat where they don't have much muscle, but they're also very lean. And what we really want to do, right, is we want to build or maintain lean tissue and burn fat. Well, that's the metabolic equivalent of patting your head and rubbing your tummy. It's not easy for the metabolism to do. There are ways to make the metabolism better multitaskers, but uh, the law of metabolic multitasking says we need to be aware of this. The third law is the law of metabolic efficiency, which is probably the most 
uh, confusing law for most people to understand because what we need to know about engines, and make no mistake about it, your metabolism is a physiological, biological engine in a sense, taking energy, fuel from the outside world and turning it into fuel for movement. Um, there is no such thing as a 100% efficient engine, and the human metabolism is no different. And so uh, an inefficient metabolism, one that is inefficient, just like an inefficient car will waste more energy and tend to be leaner and may actually be more healthy as well. And so what we want to do is we want to understand that when we are trying to get the metabolism to burn fat, we're actually trying to make the metabolism more inefficient. And that sometimes confuses people because inefficient is usually seen as a negative term, a bad word versus efficient. But I'll explain that in a minute. Um, law number four is probably the most important law. And those of you who know me know that this is what my whole philosophy has been based on. And that is the law of metabolic individuality. You know, if you see me walking across the street, you know, 50 yards away from you, you're going to recognize that I'm a human. And you'll know that, okay, that's a human. They, he moves in predictable ways. Most of us move with two legs, two arms. And I can say, hey, that's a human across the street. But as I come up on you, you're like, oh, He's unique looking. He has a unique face. He's got a bald head. He's got a goatee. He's got this big, you know, a burly uh, body, right? And he looks unique to me now. I can recognize him as human, but he's unique to me. Well, same thing with your metabolism. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. Not only that, but you have psychological differences in the way you manage stress and interact with people and personal preferences that make a difference. So metabolic individuality is absolutely key. Uh, so that is law number four. And then law number five is the law of psychic entropy. And that's a big long word, but all it means is that the willpower is real, really more like a skill power. It is like a battery. It can be drained and it can be charged up. And so this is the willpower law. And we're going to go through each of these five. So let's start with the law of metabolic compensation. First of all, when you look at your metabolism, if you start to eat less, what's going to happen? going to get hungry, right? This happens typically after about four to 10 days. Actually, it's funny, right? Most people go on a diet, they'll struggle the first couple days, then they get into a zone and they feel pretty good. And then what happens? They start to struggle again. Talked about in episode one of this podcast, the idea that hunger, energy, and cravings, heck, or sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and craving, schmeck, these biofeedback signals will go out of check whenever you eat less. Especially the more that you go to the extreme with that eating, the worse it gets. The worse the hunger will get, the worse the cravings will get. That's the metabolism compensating and pushing back against you. Likewise, if you try to exercise more and push exercise to the extreme, for most people, the vast majority of us, that too is going to cause these biofeedback sensations to go haywire. Hunger is going to go up. Cravings are going to go up. Why? Because the metabolism is a stress barometer. Its whole job is to get you back to balance, maintain homeostasis, which means balance. And so if it perceives that you're beginning to starve yourself or stressing yourself out, what is it going to do? It's going to push back against you in the other direction. So you try to eat less, it makes you eat more. You try to exercise more, it makes you want to uh, move less. And here's an interesting thing about the science here. I'll break down the metabolism for you a little bit so you can understand. There's the part of our metabolism that is changeable and the part of our metabolism that really isn't. The part of our metabolism that's not that changeable is what we call basal metabolic rate or resting energy expenditure. Those two words are synonymous, BMR or REE. And this is just the basic amount of calories you burn at rest doing nothing, sitting down, basically lying in bed all day. This is your basal metabolic rate and your resting energy expenditure. Now, a lot of people get this wrong because they think, but Jade, if you put on a bunch of muscle, doesn't that bump up your basal metabolic rate or your resting energy expenditure? And the truth is not that much, actually. Uh, you know, this idea that if you have all this extra muscle, you're going to burn all these extra calories at rest simply is not true. You probably burn, based on the research, about six calories per pound for every pound of muscle you put on. But you burn about three calories with a pound of fat. And so there's not a real big difference there. Where it becomes a big difference is when that muscle starts to move. Then, yes, more muscle means more calories burned. But just at rest, not that big of a deal. So resting energy expenditure is not that changeable. So 
there are three other components to the metabolism. There's what we call the thermic effect of food, TEF or TEF. And what this is, is every time you eat, you'll have a bump up in a metabolic rate. This, is, this has been, you know, a lot of people make a, a big deal about this, but think about it. Let's say you eat, you know, a 100-calorie candy bar, and then your metabolism goes up 20 calories. You still are 80 calories in the hole right there. You've gained 80 calories. So there is no such thing as a food that ramps up metabolic rate that much more than the calories you get. So this doesn't make that big of a difference either. So the idea that you're going to do frequent eating to stimulate your metabolism probably isn't true. And then, of course, we have what we call exercise-associated thermogenesis, EAT, right? And this is, okay, the calories we burn when we move, uh, but more when we structure exercise. And then there is non-exercise-associated thermogenesis. This is everything else that we do. This is the laundry. This is gardening. This is fidgeting. Right now, I'm on my QB elliptical. As I'm doing this, I'm, my feet are moving. That's neat. Uh, walking. Uh, sex and physical affection, um, you know, taking out the trash, taking the stairs, parking further away, all this accumulated movement throughout the day is known as non-exercise associated thermogenesis. We now know that one of the big things that metabolic compensation does is that when you start to move more, one of the things your body does unconsciously is decrease non-exercise associated thermogenesis. Now you might think that's not a big deal, but the truth of the matter is when it comes to your changeable metabolism, exercise associated thermogenesis is only about 5%, whereas NEAT, non-exercise associated thermogenesis, is about 15 to 20% of your total metabolism. So in studies, if we look at people who sit all day long and don't move much, but then go do a 30-minute exercise session versus people who move all day and do no exercise, it looks, it's starting to look like in the research that the people who are moving all day, the NEAT, they are healthier and leaner than people who aren't moving all day, getting no NEAT, but, you know, just focusing on EAT, exercise-associated thermogenesis. So this is huge, and this is part of metabolic compensation. So metabolic compensation, when you eat less and exercise more and you start to burn fat, these are all the things that are happening. One thing that happens is you get hungry your cravings go up so you consume more food. The other thing that happens is you spontaneously and unconsciously decrease need. Another thing that begins to happen is thyroid hormone and some of these hormones that regulate basal metabolic rate are turned down a little bit, but that seems to be not maybe as important as this non-exercise associated thermogenesis. So how do we then manage this? Well, the best way to manage this is to realize that the larger the calorie deficit you create, the bigger the stress on your system and the more likely your body is to compensate. One small aspect of this, by the way, for those of you who are research junkies, you know, is adaptive thermogenesis, this idea that the metabolism and the metabolic rate will kind of slow down. That's one piece of metabolic compensation, but it's not the entire story here. And so we want to be very careful here about when we create these very big calorie deficits, stressing out our system and having the metabolism push back against us. However, if we create a narrow calorie deficit, a deficit that's not as large, you know, let's say a 200 calorie deficit a day versus a thousand calorie deficit a day, the 200 calorie deficit a day is not going to be as stressful for the body. Therefore, you're going to get less metabolic compensation. And this is why I talk about the idea of rather than eating less and exercising more, we want to either eat more and exercise more or eat less and exercise less. You can still create calorie deficits with those two models, but the deficit is far more narrow and far less stressful for the metabolism. So hopefully that makes sense. That's the law of metabolic compensation at work. Now, what about the law of metabolic multitasking? This is essentially saying that there are two ways that most people see the metabolism functioning. It's either they believe you either eat less and exercise more, or you can eat more and exercise less, right? So people toggle back and forth between the couch potato, the eat more, exercise less crowd, and the exercise more, eat less crowd, which is the dieter, right? So eat less, exercise more, the dieter, eat more, exercise less, the couch potato. Most people think this is the only two places that you can go. And what's funny, if you think about the meta law of metabolic compensation, doing one leads to the other, doesn't it? So if you eat less and exercise more, you're actually setting yourself up for a period of eating more and exercising less. 
And isn't it funny that both of these two models, both the eat less, exercise more approach and the eat more, exercise less approach, both of these people, the couch potato and the dieter, have heck and schmeck out of check. In other words, hunger, energy, and cravings, heck, is out of check in both. Both are hungry. Both have cravings. Both have unpredictable and unstable energy. Same with sleep. Both can have sleep issues. Same with mood. Both can have mood off. Why? Because both of these approaches, the couch potato and the dieting model, are stressful for the metabolism. Well, there's two other places that you can go, and these are better at helping you multitask. They're better at helping you burn fat while maintaining muscle or potentially even gaining muscle if you want to create a calorie surplus. And that is the eat less, exercise less model, which is the traditional European model or hunter-gatherer model. It's like you're not exercising a whole lot. There's not a lot of structured exercise, but there is a lot of movement, walking, and neat activity, right? Eat less, exercise less. And because you're not moving so much and just because, uh, in general, the lifestyle, food was not that abundant as it is today, they're not eating a lot either. So they're not exercising a lot, which isn't ramping up their hunger. They are moving a ton, walking, and they're not eating, uh, eating a lot due to food not being there and the fact that they're not exercising a lot. So eat less, exercise less is a more balancing model. And if you do create a calorie deficit in that approach, that calorie deficit is more matched intake and output, which is far less stressful for the body. You also can do the eat more, exercise more approach, which is probably the best multitasking protocol. This is the athlete protocol, right? Uh, no athlete is going to decrease her calories and try to train for her sport. No, she's going to eat enough calories so she can perform at top level in her sport. And that is uh, important here. So eat more, exercise more is another place you can go. So when you think about the law of metabolic multitasking, you want to be thinking about the idea that it's not just eat less, exercise more, or eat more, exercise less. The two better models are eat more, exercise more, or eat less, exercise less. And they help you multitask better, avoiding the skinny fat syndrome and the muscle fat syndrome. Really quickly, again, skinny fat, right? You lose muscle, sure, and you, or you're losing fat, sure, but you lose muscle along with it. Skinny fat. Another idea is this idea of bulking where you're eating tons of protein and training with weights and all that kind of stuff, and you don't burn any fat, but you gain muscle under a layer of fat, which ends up looking a lot like a jacket over top of two sweaters. That is bulking up. You know, and oftentimes I just think this is absolutely ridiculous that trainers and people like that tell women they can't bulk up. Absolutely women can bulk up. If you're gaining muscle under a layer of fat that you're not burning, that is the very definition of bulking up. And so, yes, this multitasking stuff really matters. And so we have to be aware of that. Uh, this is very important. Quick break, want to tell you about a resource you are definitely going to want to check out. I know not all of you are metabolic experts, you're not scientists, you're not biochemists, you don't necessarily know about hormones and endocrinology. So I created a free program for you, Metabolism School, to help you understand this stuff in more detail. If you would like the free course, you can go to drjade.com slash metabolism dash school drjade.com slash metabolism dash school get the free metabolism school resource it'll teach you everything you need to know in depth and really get you caught up on the science thanks so much guys back to the podcast now we get to the law of metabolic efficiency right metabolic efficiency is really tricky here because we want our engine to be more inefficient. Let me explain how this works. You eat a food. What you would love to have happen is for less of those calories to be digested and absorbed, have them just be removed out, right? And at the same time, you want more of those calories to be burned off. That is an inefficient process. You want to inefficiently extract calories from food and inefficiently uh, use energy and create more heat, dissipate more heat energy, and that will lead to a leaner physique. If you're very efficient at extracting calories from food and very efficient at storing fat, that's not a good thing. You want to be inefficient at, at extracting calories and inefficient at storing fat. And so how do we do this? Well, you want to eat inefficient foods. 
just really quickly, protein-based foods and vegetable-based foods, foods with lots and lots of fiber and lots of protein, are very difficult to digest for the system. This is why if you ever go on a diet and you add a bunch of vegetables and protein into your diet, you can get a lot of gas and bloating if you do that too fast because the digestive system has to work on these more inefficient calories. And so less calorie, less nutrients are extracted from these. This is why it's very difficult that, you know, back in the day, you know, the early sort of uh, our ancestors who came to America, you know, when they were eating these very lean animals in the wintertime, rabbit, there's something called rabbit sickness where rabbits have are very lean, don't have a whole lot of fat on them. And they were eating lots of vegetable matter. And many of these people were starving because they couldn't get the nutrients uh, that they needed from these very high protein, low fat, and, you know, very fiber dense foods. That was uh, detrimental to them back then, but they didn't have the cheesecake factory and things like that. So now you can use that to your advantage, adding lots of protein and fiber, inefficient foods, right? Protein is also fiber, right? It doesn't provide any calories and the, and the protein calories that are provided, protein is more inefficiently stored as fat and it also could be stored as muscle, right? So it's just more inefficient in terms of storage capacity compared to starch or sugar or the fat that you would eat. So that's important for you to understand. Another thing here is that you know, this is where persistent organic pollutants, plasticizers, pesticides, these kinds of things, we accumulate these in our system and they bioaccumulate. What that essentially means is if you have a fish, small fish eating plankton that are loaded with toxins, the, they will accumulate some of that in their system, but then the bigger predatory fish will end up accumulating the highest amounts because they're eating the fish that are eating the source of the toxins. It's the same thing with us. If we are eating fatty animals that are eating pesticide-laden uh, you know, grains and uh, foliage and things like that, we're going to bioaccumulate those. If we are drinking water out of plastic bottles and all those kinds of things, we can bioaccumulate in our fat cells these persistent organic pollutants. And this is an emerging uh, science that we now understand how these things are making our metabolisms more efficient at storing fat. The primary way that they do that is they work as endocrine disruptors. An endocrine organ is a hormone secreting organ. They work as an endocrine disruptor primarily at the level of the thyroid. And so they cause the thyroid gland to make less thyroid hormone. They also cause the body to excrete more thyroid hormone, and they also are interfering with the ability of thyroid hormone to bind their receptors because they're competing with some of those things. And so what happens is metabolic rate becomes declined and you become more efficient at storing fat as a result of these persistent organic pollutants. So not only do we want to ramp up our fiber and our protein intake, we might want to consider doing our best to get rid of these persistent organic pollutants. The best way to do that is to avoid the sources of them, moving towards plastic, uh, away from plastic and more glass bottles and things like that, and moving away from pesticide-laden foods, and then using some kind of detox apparatus, sweating being the best. This is why sauna therapies can be so useful. They've shown that sweating is probably the best way to get rid of these persistent organic pollutants. And I'll do another podcast on that uh, later on. But one final thing I'll say here about efficiency uh, is the idea of bugs, the microbiome we call euphemistically bugs, all the bacteria living in your digestive tract. These things can act like that annoying little friend that keeps stealing french fries off your plate when you go to lunch with them. Some of these bacteria extract more calories from the food you eat, which would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Because then there's more less calories that get into your system to get absorbed. And some certain bugs uh, ex extract less, meaning you get more of these calories. And so these bugs now are not only using some of our calories before we can get to it, but they also are having some uh, endocrine properties, actually. We're now seeing that the bacteria that live inside our gut are secreting chemicals biochemicals, hormone-like substances that go into our bloodstream and can have positive or negative effects, making us more inefficient at storing fat or more efficient at storing fat based on the types of bacteria that we have in our digestive tract. What it looks like now is a higher fiber diet and also including things like fermented foods, sauerkraut, yogurts, things like that, uh, 
kefir, uh, you know, kombucha, all these kinds of things can have benefit potentially because they are changing the microbiota in our gut and allowing us to be more inefficient at extracting calories. And so this efficiency argument is really important. Now, of course, exercise is the same thing, right? Uh, aerobic-based, traditional aerobic exercise actually uh, burns a higher percentage of fat than something like, and, and more calories than something like high-intensity interval training or weightlifting. But also, because it burns fat, it may make you more efficient, right, at storing that same fat because you're getting used to this idea of I use fat to fuel my exercise, therefore I'm going to get pretty efficient at this. And I used to see this in clinical practice where you'd have runners come in, twist their ankles, things like that, and then blow up like water balloons so quickly if they didn't change their diet to match because they're just so efficient, more efficient now at storing fat. Whereas weight training and things like that don't burn near as many calories as maybe running will during the exercise, but they elevate cal caloric burn for hours and potentially even days after the workout. This is where some things like metabolic conditioning, these short duration, high intensity workouts come in because they make us a little less efficient at storing fat and burning, we burn up more energy in the post-workout period. And so if you want to take advantage of this law of metabolic efficiency. You want to be thinking protein and fiber. You want to be looking after persistent organic pollutants and probiotics. And you also want to be moving more towards weight training and high intensity interval training and maybe away from, you know, sort of long duration exercise. Now, let me say this just as a, as a segue into the next thing. Metabolic individuality is the next piece here. So yes, will you find runners who are extremely lean? Of course you will. They are unique. Very rarely have I seen someone who's overweight take up running and successfully lose the weight and keep it off. I have seen some. Certainly it happens, but they're in the minority. And so the point here, though, is to realize that if you're a traditional runner or an aerobic exerciser, that may work wonderfully for you. I mean, one of the things that does is it's wonderful in the research for brain chemistry. It's one of the best things for mood enhancement. It may not be the best thing, though, for many people who are trying to burn fat and, you know, gain or maintain muscle. It can be for some, and, uh, but it may not be the best thing. And so you want to honor your unique metabolism. Those of you who know running works for you, do it. Uh, my favorite quote is one by Bruce Lee, and it sums up the metabolic individuality thing, you know, uh, law rather, and it is, you know, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. In a sense, we are absorbing the things that we learn that are new, that work for us, so we're trying it on like a detective, right, playing metabolic detective. We're getting rid of the stuff we know doesn't work, it doesn't suit our personal preferences, and we're keeping the things that we know we love, either via personal preference or work for us. So if you're someone who loves uh, aerobic exercise and or it works for you, definitely you need to incorporate it, right? So you can't get too bogged down in some of the science in the other laws. You have to filter all these other laws through the law of metabolic individuality. You are unique metabolically, psychologically, and in your personal preferences. One key example here, and obviously I'll cover these in more in depth in a later podcast, is the idea of buffer and trigger foods. For me, if I have wine with my dinner, it is a buffer food for me. If I have wine with my steak and my broccoli or my salmon and my kale, a glass of wine keeps me from wanting the rice and the bread and then ordering dessert later. So actually that wine ends up buffering against me eating worse foods later. Some people have wine with dinner and they want another glass of wine and then another glass of wine. Then they eat more starch because they had the wine. Then they had dessert because they had the wine. And in that case, that's a trigger food. And so this is one small example of honoring your metabolic individuality in terms of your metabolism, your psychology, and your personal preferences. For example, there are some people can have a little Hershey's kiss at three o'clock in the afternoon, little piece of chocolate and have it be a buffer food. Other people do that and it makes them crave more junk food at that moment and more junk food later. You need to understand how this stuff works. By the way, if you love chocolate, it is absolutely ludicrous to go on a diet or a program that takes chocolate completely out of your diet like you can never have it again because what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to have it. Law of metabolic compensation says eventually you'll have it and probably binge on it, right? So very important law, the law of metabolic individuality. The final law is 
the law of psychic entropy. Now, the science on this is interesting. Uh, there was several studies back uh, about five, six years ago now, maybe even longer, that basically showed that the uh, metabolism, the brain, is fatigable. Every time you self-edit, anytime you have a long day at work, anytime you have emotional issues, your brain is sort of being drained, right? And you can make less positive decisions. This makes common sense, right? Well, what we were basically showing in the research, or what they were showing in the research, rather, is that you can have a willpower battery that is fatigable. In other words, at the end of the day, after a long day of lots of projects and everything else, you get home and you're less likely to be able to make good decisions. Uh, or if you have low blood sugar, you're less likely to make a good food decision. You're more likely to make a bad food decision. Stress, we now know excess stress pings the reward centers in the brain and down regulates the motivation centers in the brain. This is one piece of this science. So willpower is a lot like a battery. And so we started to learn that. Now, some of the newer research in this area is not uh, able to duplicate some of these studies, but still it makes common sense, right? We still know that stress can drain our, quote, willpower battery. We also know that willpower is very much more like skill power, isn't it? That you can actually learn certain things. Like, for example, uh, understanding your buffer and trigger foods is a skill that will help your willpower later on, right? I, uh, I developed uh, a practice after reading um, some of this research on uh, dessert, where I used to order dessert. I used to avoid dessert, rather, all the time because I have a huge sweet tooth, those that know me. And uh, then I'd find myself at, you know, the Cheesecake Factory or some other place where I'm just binging on desserts all of a sudden. And it really was derailing my diet. Then I made the choice after seeing some of this research to do a willpower challenge where I would look back into skill power and be like, okay, I'm going to have dessert every time. I'm going to order dessert every time I go out to eat, and I still do that now, and I force myself to only have three bites. Initially, this started with I'd get dessert anytime I was with four people or more so we could split it. And then it was I would get dessert when I was hanging out with my wife, my ex-wife, Jill, and we would split it. And now I just can get dessert by myself and take three bites, and I have built up that skill power. I went from someone who was uh, – a person who anytime he had junk food in the house, he had to eat it all, crush all the bags of chips and all the other stuff. And now, because of these willpower challenges, I have chips and things like that in my house, and I don't have to overeat them. So I developed this skill power around this. So these are the laws of metabolism, the five laws. Really quick, the law of metabolic compensation. You do one thing to the metabolism, it will push back against you in the opposite direction. The law of metabolic multitasking, which essentially says there are four different metabolic toggles to use, two of them better than the other two. Eat less, exercise more, and eat more, exercise less. These are a little bit more stressful versus eat less, exercise less, and eat more, exercise more, a little less stressful, and they're better able to help you multitask. The law of metabolic efficiency, which essentially says we want inefficient fuels and exercise that makes our body inefficient. We also want to take... Uh, care to pay attention to some of the things in our environment that could be making our metabolism more efficient at storing fat. Law of metabolic individuality, meaning we have to honor our own metabolic tendencies, psychology, and personal preferences. And then, of course, the law of metabolic willpower effect or the law of psychic entropy and this willpower uh, sort of idea. So I'm going to end the podcast there today. That's a lot of information, I know, but this framework is going to be something that you'll see come up again and again in uh, you know, the, the podcast as we really touch on and learn all the basics of metabolism. These five laws are something that you'll want to um, consider, to spend some time with, and to understand, and hopefully they will, as a result of understanding them, allow you to now have less of a tendency to oversimplify the metabolism and a place to put all the new information that you're going to learn into one of these five boxes and say, oh, I see, that is a compensation issue or that is an efficiency issue or that is an individuality issue. 
All right, guys, thanks for being on the podcast today. I hope you enjoyed that. Please uh, do me a favor. Go over to iTunes. Please subscribe to the podcast. Leave a review there for me. I would greatly appreciate that, and I will see you guys at the next podcast. Pop it in real quick just to say thank you so much for your interest and support of the JATina.com podcast. I am bringing back by popular demand the live Q&A calls I used to do back in the day where you can get on live with me, ask your question directly, and have me answer it in full. Questions about thyroid and adrenal health, autoimmune disease, any health condition, belly fat, muscle building, performance enhancement, you name it, we are going to cover it on the Q&A podcast. If you'd like to be on these live Q&A calls with me and speak to me directly, all you need to do is become a patron of the podcast. You can go to www.patreon.com backslash JTita. That's www.patreon.com slash JTita. Become a patron of of the podcast i would greatly appreciate your support and you'll be able to access me live to answer all your questions in depth thanks again for your support see you on the podcast